So I was watching television last night, and this commercial comes on. And I, I just have to tell you about this commercial because it drives me crazy. So it's a woman, and she is, I think she's bowling. And she's bowling, and then all of a sudden, a puppet bladder comes next to her. Have you seen this commercial? There's this, I mean, first of all, it's just too weird. This pink thing with huge eyes comes and grabs a woman's hand like, we got to go, we got to go. And I, I, I mean, if you were in the bowling alley and you saw this, wouldn't you wonder what's going on? I mean, there, it's, no one else seems to be bothered by this bladder. And, and then worse, the woman starts to talk to her bladder. <laughs> no, I'm going to take control. We're going to go see a doctor. And then the bladder goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. Like, uh, the bladder never talks. No, no, no talking from the bladder. So, so then, so now we get to see a picture of a frame where she, the woman is there, her doctor is there, and in the seat behind, beside her is her bladder. <laughs> this is stupid. And her bla and the bladder. I mean, they didn't even get a, a high a high chair for the bladder. So you just see this big eyes. And what's worse is if you were the woman's doctor, wouldn't you? Uh, say, I think you have something more than her, your bladder going on here. I mean, you're talking to your bladder. You, we could see the psychologist down the road here. I think that might be helpful for you. But the doctor starts to talk to the bladder too. This is dumb. And then, so evidently they get whatever she's supposed to have, some kind of drug or whatever. And then the next frame is the woman who is having a date and who is there beside the date but the bladder as well? I mean, once you get the bladder over control, do you th think that the bladder still has to come on the This is just stupid. Okay, I, I just had to get that off my chest. It has nothing to do with the sermon. <clears throat> I, I, it's just dumb. So here we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You're... Yeah, I, 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 it's, I just hate that commercial. So um, we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We've gone through uh, two of his prayers already. The first uh, thing he prays for is he prays for himself, giving us a model saying, it is good for us to pray for ourselves. If Jesus can pray for himself, we certainly can pray for ourselves. So um, some of you I know go, uh, Jesus isn't interested in all those little tiny things or whatever. And uh, perfectly fine for you to bring up anything with Jesus. You can pray for yourself. Then he prays for his disciples, the ones who are following him. His, um, some might think it's just the 12. I, I think there's a, a differentiation between perhaps some of those who are closer to him than, than the all believers. But regardless, what Jesus is praying for with all believers, I think, is all believers in the past, the present, and what's going to be who we are, the future, and us beyond. So, so he's praying for his disciples. He, remember what he prayed for for his disciples was that... Um, that they wouldn't necessarily be removed from situations where they're encountering hardship. Remember what Jesus prays for as he says that they would be in the world but not of the world, and that when they encounter hardships, that they would know the presence of God. So they would be able to get through anything with the presence of God. So he's not saying, okay, whenever you pray and you pray for yourself and you say, Jesus, rescue me out of this situation. I don't want to be in this situation anymore. Jesus doesn't pray that for us. Instead, Jesus prays for when, when the believers pray, God, listen to their prayer and be present with them. And now here we are in the Garden of Gethsemane, part three of this prayer. He is praying for all believers. And when, this is from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John tends to be, I think, wordier and less, well, he has lots of stories in the Gospel of John as well, but there's, there's stuff that's going on in the Gospel of John that I go, man, would you, just, would you just tell me something in plain language? For instance, the Gospel of John begins like this. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <coughs> and, and that is, instead of the, the, telling us how Jesus was born, that's what we get from the Gospel of John. That's all we get about Jesus' birth. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here he is praying for unity. 
And he's praying this prayer, and it, it, I don't, it's not discombobulated. It's just hard to follow. He's saying, you are in me, I am in you, and I pray that all the believers will also experience that same kind of unity. He keeps praying for this unity among the believers. Well, I think about unity, and I'm going, well, okay, so that's, the, that's what he's really talking about in this particular passage. He's saying there's a unity among the believers that he wants us to have. So what would that look like if that prayer were answered? What would it look like if there was a unity among all believers in Jesus Christ? And for me, what I first think of, okay, well, if there was a unity among believers, then there wouldn't necessarily need to be all kinds of different kinds of Christian congregations. There wouldn't need to be um, Baptists who believe in one particular way, or Methodists who believe in one particular way, and, and Lutherans who believe in a way, and, and Presbyterians and so forth. There would be this unity. We would all have the same kind of understanding. And although I, we're all Christians, we just see how we practice our faith in different kinds of ways. What would that be like if all of us came together and we believed everything the same? I don't know how it would happen. And yet that's Jesus' prayer for us, to have unity. And then I kept thinking, well, Jesus, you're the one who, who created us. You're the one who, who, from the very beginnings, before, I mean, here it is, here in the Gospel of John we're hearing, before there was even creation, there was Christ with God. And so when, G, when, when there's creation, remember the first time that there's anything created, we have the, the, the sun and the moon, and we have the darkness from the night, and then the waters and the land, and it keeps on going until we get to the, what, what I understand to be the crown of creation, because we're created in God's image. We are created, and after every day of creation, the Lord said it was? And so I'm thinking, okay, well, Jesus, you created us to be different. There isn't a person in this room that has had a, a clone that's been before you, and there won't be a person like you ever again in all of history. We are all unique. We have some commonalities. We, have some, we, we, we share a language right now. We share a, a place where a geographic space where we're at, but all of us are created unique, and yet we are created in the image of God. And so I'm, and here's Jesus praying for unity. If Jesus was praying for unity, then wouldn't we all basically look the same or, if, or at the very worst, all think the same about who Jesus is? But we don't. So what is he praying for? What is this unity that Jesus wants us to share? So I kept thinking about that. And I kept thinking, okay, well, the other thing that Jesus talks about often is we are called to be the body. We are the body. We are, we are the body here present in this place. And so when I was thinking about the body, I was thinking, okay, well, hey, whenever my body has a cold like it does right now, I don't ever pray that I keep the cold. I pray that it would go away. Do any of you ever pray that you would keep a cold or sickness? No. You pray that it would evacuate, that it would leave you. And our bodies are designed in such that whenever an intruder comes within our body, then our bodies start to react and say, oh, this isn't what, something that should be here, and it starts to attack it. Our white blood cells grow in number, and they start to do things like cause mucus. That's kind of icky. You know, and... and that starts to pour out of us, and there are other things that pour out of us that we don't need to talk about. But, um, but you get the sense. I mean, what happens is whenever something is causing disunity, there's a way for it to get, to get rid of. And if we are the body of Christ, then there are things that need to, to leave. So, okay, well, I, I kind of get that. But Jesus, I'm still struggling with what does it mean to be unified when we're also very different. And then there's this word that kept coming in some of the commentaries, and it's called indwelling. Indwelling. So 
God be in us. What does that look like? And how on earth can all of us do that? What is this indwelling? And I began to think about when Jesus was born. You all remember the Christmas story, right? It hasn't been that long ago. A good yes would be okay, but whatever. Okay. So, who's, uh, so, so if you read the Christmas story, you're going to find it in the book of Luke, this particular part. So there's Mary. And Mary gets a visit from Gabriel, the angel. Gabriel, the angel, comes and says, Mary, you who are highly favored, you are going to be the mother of the Son of God. Mary says, uh, among other things, she says, you know, how can this be? I, I'm, I haven't been with anybody before. I've never done this before. And this is what Gabe says. Gabe says, all right, here's what's going to happen, Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will conceive through the Holy Spirit. Now, when, you, when we're reading the Christmas story, we just kind of think, oh, that's kind of nice and blah, blah, blah. But I want you to think for a moment what's really going on there. The Holy Spirit is having a union with Mary, who's never had a union with any person before in that sense. They are coming together as one. Now, some of you women out there have been pregnant before. Uh, I, want, I want you to think for a moment. Do we have any pregnant women among us right now that want to? No? Yes? No? Okay. Yeah, I thought most of us had, had already had our children so far. Um, in any case, so if, you're, if, you've been, if you've ever been pregnant before and you've carried a child, do you know the difference between your child and you? Yes, right? You can feel that kid move around and kick and keep you up at night, right? And, and do you talk to that kid? Oh, yes. Do you tell the kid to behave? Okay. But... You and that kid are one. There, you, are the, you are sharing the same body. There is this, what, what we call in, in Christian terms, it's called the incarnation. It just means that Christ becomes flesh. But here, I'm, I'm starting to get this understanding of unity for a moment. Okay. So... There's this person that can live inside of us, and they are a distinct individual, and we are who we are, and yet we are one. And I'm starting to get this understanding, okay, well, if God's all right with this unity thing, then it's, it's all right for us to be who we are, and yet somehow we're called to be the same. And so I start, okay, so we got... The incarnation, we got that going on. And then I flipped back to the book of Genesis. And you might be familiar with this part of the book of Genesis. So in the beginning, there are, uh, there's Adam and there's Eve, right? Do you remember Adam and Eve? Yes. It's good. You're, you're getting a little more vocal. That's good. All right. So there's Adam and, you're, and there's Eve. <coughs> They're in the garden. And um, the Bible simply says this. The two become one. Now, when I do premarital counseling with folks... I say, I want you to be, we go back to the garden, and we go, all right, where was the, the pastor? Where were the gowns? How many attendants do you think Adam and Eve had? You know, all those kinds of things. What, I mean, how much did they spend on the wedding? None of that stuff is there. The only thing that we get from, from Genesis is the two become one. Now, most of you in this room are adults. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Thank you. Now, when I'm talking to premarital folks, usually, not always, but usually, the folks who I'm talking with have already had a marriage. And I'm not meaning a legal marriage where they had to go to the courthouse. I'm meaning the two become one. I believe, in God's eyes, that's a marriage. There's nothing else that's going on there. We know that Adam and Eve, they become one, and there's a marriage. I tell my premarital folks, so my hunch is that you might be already married and we're going to celebrate a wedding. I'm good with that, but I just want you to know that um, if you've had other marriages in the past, you need to talk to each other about that. 
But I want you to think for a moment about Adam and Eve coming together and the two become one. There's an intimacy there that we usually just skim over. But can, I want you to think about that for a moment. There's this, there's this bond that they share. They are one. And yet they are very different. And I'm beginning to understand a little bit more about what Jesus is praying for when he's asking us to be unified. So it doesn't mean giving up everything that I know and trying to find some kind of place where I can sign an agreement. It still means, though, that there is, it's, it's much more than that. There's this connection, a physical connection when he calls us to be unified. We're going to go back to the Garden of Gethsemane for a moment. So there he is. Before we get to Gethsemane, let's, let's stop off at the upper room. So it's Thursday night. This is the last time that Jesus is going to meet with his apostles, his disciples in this kind of way. And what he decides to do, among all things, I mean, he could have given them... I mean, there's no sermon at the upper room. There's no long dissertation. Instead, what Jesus does, in the book of John, you'll find that what he does first is he washes the feet of the disciples so that they understand that, they, um, that he is acting as their servant and he is ask, asking them to model that so that we would be servants to the world. And then what he does after that's all done, he, he takes the Passover bread and he gives it to everybody. And remember what he says? He says, take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat this in remembrance of me. And so they all eat the bread. Now, bread is different, right? I mean, there's... We all know what bread is. I, I happen to love bread. And um, so when you eat that bread, it becomes part of you. Right? It becomes part of you. And then when you take the cup and you drink the cup, remember what Jesus says? This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness and sin. And when you drink that cup, it becomes part of who you are. And that whole understanding about indwelling just starts to heap on one upon the other. So when Jesus starts to pray for unity, he wants us to understand, remember his words are, that they would be in me and I would be in them. We are called to be Jesus-like. Now, sometimes we do a fairly good job at that, and sometimes we don't. Most of the time, we probably don't think too much about it. There are times when you say something that to someone else they're going to see, oh, wow, what made you say something like that? It's so, so unselfish. And I believe it's because Jesus is within us. Or you do something on somebody else's behalf, and you're, at least your primary motivation isn't so that you get something back. It's just because you see that you need to help somebody. And my belief is that's what Jesus is praying for, that unity would be shown throughout so that when, when people see us, they see what Jesus is like. We need to be like Jesus. And we can only because he resides in us. Now, my understanding of what it means to be Jesus, above all the other things, is to show forgiveness. That's pretty tough. It's not easy to show forgiveness. Because my guess is that there's a person in this room, maybe all of us, who has been hurt before. And some of those hurts have been really, really deep. And we have 
nasty scars to show. But above all things, what Jesus was doing for us is when, well, now we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? So all the disciples are there. Jesus has been praying. And when the guard shows up and they arrest Jesus, the disciples go, even Peter. Peter, who said to Jesus not hours before, if, even if everybody else leaves, I will not leave you, God. And remember what Jesus says. Jesus says, Peter, even you, even this very night, you will deny who I am before the rooster crows. Not just once, not twice, three times. Pete can't believe it. But they all scatter. Now Pete tries to find his way back into the courtyard, remember? And so he's there, and while Jesus is in there being uh, mocked and ridiculed, there's some people outside, and they're saying, well, Peter, weren't you one of them? And No, no, I'm, no I, don't, I don't know him. I, I don't have anything. No. He's, he's trying to be able to stay there present, and he doesn't, I don't even know if he bel- knows what he's saying. And the book of John does this. When the rooster crows, somehow Pete and Jesus match eyes, and Peter knows what he's done. And he goes away, come to the cross, the place of execution of Jesus Christ. Notice who's around the cross. You'll notice it's centurions. You'll notice that there are the high officials of the church. But where are his apostles? Where are his followers? Where are all those people who are waving palm branches and everything the week before? They are not there. But do you hear what Jesus says on the cross? One of his last phrases is this. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. If we're going to have unity in anything at all as Christians, it's my prayer that it will be, Father, forgive them. I lied to you about the the bladder commercial, by the way. I still think it's awfully weird. But I was thinking about that bladder in the body of Christ. And too often, friends, we allow for parts of the body to take control. It shouldn't be the bladder. It should be the head. Who is Jesus? Amen. I'm going to invite us to stand and sing together. This